come to order. Without objection, the chair reserves the right to declare the committee in recess at any point. But before I begin, I want to uh, remind those in the audience, this hearing is open to the public, but actions that disrupt or distract from the proceedings will not be tolerated. I also want to remind members that if you have to enter or leave the room, please do so through the ante room and not through the doors in the back because the noise is very distracting to our witnesses and members on the dais. Uh, the chair reserves the right to remove disruptive persons from the hearing. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing uh, and for your service to our nation. Over the last two months, we've heard from each of our combatant commanders uh, that the threats we face today are more complex and more formidable than at any point over the last 30 years. Uh, they re each raised grave concerns about how China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are working together to reduce America's global influence, harm our alliances, and undermine our national security. Iran and North Korea are arming Russia with deadly effect in Ukraine. And China's No Limits partnership with Russia is paying off for both countries. Russia is getting critical economic assistance, rocket motors, and microelectronics from China. Putin is using the assistance to keep his economy afloat and to produce the missiles, aircraft, and other weaponry that is devastating Ukraine. China is getting cheap oil and vital missile technology and enriched uranium from Russia. Z is, use, is using the assistance to help his economy recover and to fuel his breathtaking buildup of space-based and nuclear weapons. China is also buying over a million bears of oil a day from Iran in defiance of Western sanctions. The, Ayata the Ayatollah is using the oil revenues to fund his nuclear ambitions, arm his terrorist proxies, and launch an unprecedented and unjustified direct attack on Israel. Putin, Z, Kim, and the Ayatollah are testing the credibility of American deterrence and the strength of our alliances. After witnessing the President's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan and his hand-wringing approach to providing lethal aid to Ukraine, uh, they sense weakness in American resolve. We can't leave them with that impression. And we can't let them continue to get away with their malign actions. We must restore American deterrence. But to do so, we need a budget that will enable that. We need a budget that supports the rapid modernization of our military, a budget that fully funds readiness to ensure we can fight tonight, and a budget that will improve the quality of life of our service members so we can recruit and retain the most, le most lethal fighting force on the planet. Unfortunately, this budget does not do those things. The 1% increase is uh, is it, it proposes entirely is inadequate. It actually is a 2% cut when you factor in inflation. But this is the hand dealt to us by the Fiscal Responsibility Act that we all have responsibility uh, for enacting. As we move to mark up the FY25 NDA, we will uh, play that hand that was dealt us. But we all need to understand the risk to our national security that this level of investment presents. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about what this budget means for our military readiness, our modernization timeliness, and our efforts to improve service member quality of life. And most importantly, what this budget means for our ability to deter our increasingly undeterred adversaries. With that, I yield to my friend and colleague, the ranking member, for any opening statement he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome our witnesses, Secretary Austin, General Brown, Mr. McCord. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your leadership in, in very, very difficult times. I think the chairman laid it out fairly well. It can be summed up as big threats and a tight budget. Uh, and you have to figure out how to make that work. But as the chairman noted, we have that tight budget because that's what Congress passed and the president signed, so we will have to find a way to live within it. I think the you know, national security strategy lays out those threats quite well. Uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and then various transnational terrorist groups 
all of which are causing you know, challenges across the world. I don't disagree with the chairman's assessment of those challenges or how increasingly uh, the problem is they are working together more and more um, to coordinate those threats in a way that are deeply challenging. We do want to hear today, obviously, about the, the two specific hottest spots right now, what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, it is good that Congress finally passed the aid package to Ukraine. Uh, the months of delay were very costly. I uh, would very, be very interested in your uh, military opinion about where the fight in, in Ukraine goes from here, in Ukraine's ability to hold off the assaults that are coming from Russia. In the Middle East, uh, the war rages on with a continual threat that it could spread. Um, I want to compliment the administration and uh, Secretary Austin in particular, Chairman Brown, for the work to try and contain that, to work with our partners, to work with our allies. Um, but that challenge continues. And I think it is even more important um, that President Biden continues his push to try to get huma a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza with the release of the hostages. Um, I know the President has been negotiating that. A number of terms have been put on the table. Hamas has repeatedly refused to accept that. I, I, I don't think we should stop trying to get to that humanitarian ceasefire going forward and to work to make sure that we get more aid into Gaza. I know that we have begun to uh, build the pier uh, to help get uh, aid in from the sea. Uh, any and all efforts uh, necessary must be put in place, which I, which I very much appreciate. Um, in terms of dealing with the big threats on that tight budget, I want to advance the idea two things. One, we need partnerships and we need diplomacy. Um, we cannot do it alone, and we cannot fight everybody everywhere all at once. We may not like a wide variety of things that these actors that we've talked about are doing. We have to live in the same world that they do, which means we have to talk to China. Yes, at some point, I believe we need to talk to Russia. Um, we need to use our diplomatic skills and our partnerships and alliances, because one of the things I'm really worried about is that Iran, Russia, China, and the others they're beginning to build partnerships. They're beginning to undermine our economic might. The chairman laid out how they are fighting back against our sanctions by working together. We cannot alienate the entire world and still meet these threats. We need the rest of the world on our side. So I hope we will consider uh, building on the partnerships and diplomacy that we have used. I think the AUKUS agreement is a great example, the Quad that we've used, um, the 54-nation partnership that was pulled together to help um, Ukraine fight off Russia. All those are good examples, but we need to build on that. Lastly, I just want to foot stop what the chairman said about recruitment and retention. Thank him um, and thank the Quality of Life panel, uh, Representative Houlihan, Representative Bacon led, uh, which is focused on making sure that we give our servicemen and women and their families everything they need and give them the support. They are the backbone of our military without any question, and they deserve our support. With that, I look forward to the testimony, and I yield back. Thank you. I thank the ranking member. Uh, our witnesses today are the Honorable Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, General C.Q. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Accompanying the Secretary and the Chairman is the Honorable Mike McCord, Under Secretary of Defense. He serves as the DOD's Chief Financial Officer and is available to answer questions. No small job given uh, that he's the Chief Financial Officer of the largest organization on the planet. Uh, with that, uh, we will recognize our fir first witness, uh, Secretary Austin. We'll start with you. Uh, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify in support of President Biden's proposed fiscal year 2025 budget for the Department of Defense. Pleased to be joined by our outstanding Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General C.Q. Brown, and by Undersecretary Mike McCord, the Department's Comptroller. Let me start by thanking this committee for all that you do to support the U.S. military, our troops, and our military families. As Secretary, I have always been guided by three priorities. Defending our nation, taking care of our families, taking care of our people, and succeeding through teamwork. Our budget request for fiscal year 2025 will advance all three of these priorities. First, the President's request will invest in cutting-edge capabilities across all domains. That includes $48.1 billion for naval and shipbuilding capabilities, $62.1 billion to reinforce U.S. air dominance, and $13 billion to bolster Army and Marine Corps combat capabilities. Our request will also provide $33.7 billion to strengthen our space architecture, 
and $14.5 billion to develop and field advanced cybersecurity tools. It will direct $49.2 billion to modernize and recapitalize all three legs of our nuclear triad. And it will sharpen our tech edge through a $167.5 billion investment in procurement and $143.2 billion in R&D. Second, this budget will support our outstanding troops and their families. That includes raising base pay and housing allowances, investing in better housing, making child care more affordable, and funding vital work to prevent sexual assault and suicide in the military. And third, this request will help the department further deepen our teamwork worldwide. Our network of allies and partners remains a strategic advantage that no competitor can match. And you can see its power in our strengthening ties across the Indo-Pacific, in today's expanded and united NATO, and in the 50-country Ukraine Defense Contact Group that I convene. Our budget remains rooted in our 2022 National Defense Strategy. Our request positions the United States to tackle the department's pacing challenge, the People's Republic of China, with confidence and urgency. It will help meet the acute threat of Putin's increasingly aggressive Russia. It will help us tackle the persistent dangers from Iran and its proxies. It will help us take on threats from North Korea, global terrorist organizations, and other malign actors. And it will help us continue to deter aggression against the United States and our allies and partners and to prevail in conflict if necessary. Now today, I want to underscore three key messages. First, even as our budget request abides by the mandatory caps set by the Fiscal Responsibility Act, it is aligned to our strategy. We made tough but responsible decisions that prioritize near-term readiness, modernization of the joint force, and support for our troops and their families. Our approach dials back some near-term modernization for programs not set to come online until the 2030s. Second, we can only reach the goals of our strategy with your help. And I'm truly grateful that Congress passed the fiscal year 2024 appropriations in March. And the single way that, the single greatest way that Congress can support the department is to pass predictable, sustained, and timely appropriations. My third and final message is that the price of U.S. leadership is real, but it is far lower than the price of U.S. abdication. As the President has said, we are in a global struggle between democracy and autocracy, and our security relies on American strength of purpose. And that's why our budget request seeks to invest in American security and in America's defense industrial base. The same is true for the recently passed National Security Supplemental that will support our partners in Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and make key investments uh, to increase submarine production. In fact, about $50 billion of this supplemental will flow through our defense industrial base, creating good jobs, good American jobs, uh, in more than 30 states. So we're grateful for our partners in Congress who help How help. Can you help talk about U.S. leadership when we're supporting genocide in Gaza? You Committee will come to order. I'd like to formally request those in the audience causing disruption to cease their actions immediately. Security, I'm going to ask you to remove the disruptive persons. It is illegal, it is immoral, it is disgusting. The whole world is watching what we are doing in Gaza right now. Secretary General, you are supporting a genocide. Stop supporting genocide. Apparently, the protesters don't understand we don't have a secretary general in this country. Uh, with that, Mr. Secretary, you're recognized again. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we, we're grateful for our, uh, for our partners in Congress who help, help us make the investments needed to strengthen America's security uh, through both the supplemental and the President's budget requests. The U.S. military is the most lethal fighting force on Earth, and with your help, we're going to keep it that way. And I deeply appreciate your support for our mission and for our troops. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. General Brown, you're now recognized. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to join Secretary Austin and Honorable Law Mike McCord to appear before you today. On behalf of the Joint Force, Department of Defense, civilians, and our families, 
I want to thank Congress for your steadfast support and the opportunity to testify on the fiscal year 2025 defense budget request, which reflects our shared commitment to national security. I also want to thank you for passing the National Security Supplemental, which provides vital support to our allies, partners, and our defense industrial base to counter aggression and strengthen our joint force capabilities and capacity in preparation for any future contingency. The global security environment is increasingly complex. The 2022 National Defense Strategy identifies five key challenges. The People's Republic of China, our pacing challenge, continues its risky behavior around the globe. The newly aggressive Russia, with its unprovoked war against Ukraine, the reckless Iran, who, as we saw a few weeks ago, attempts to escalate regional uh, conflict with unprecedented attacks and support of proxy forces. A destabilizing North Korea, which threatens regional security, and violent extremist organizations with leveraged instability to advance their cause. These challenges are interconnected, which demands a strategic approach addressing the immediate threats while also preparing for future contingencies. It requires all of us to operate with a sense of urgency. Days after becoming the chairman, I laid out three expectations in my message to the Joint Force. Honing our warfighting skills has primacy in all we do, modernizing and aggressively leading with new concepts and approaches, and trust is the foundation of our profession. Our military exists to fight and win our nation's wars. We train every day to ensure we are so good at what we do that we deter any adversary from engaging the U.S. in conflict. This budget requests $147 billion to sustain readiness and ensure the department can counter near-term threats. We are also focused on better integrating our allies and partners in our planning and operations by investing in critical programs and suspend. Gen just we will remain in recess until the disruptive individuals are removed from the chamber. General, you may proceed. Sure. We are uh, all focused on better integrating our allies and partners in our planning and operations by investing in critical programs and capability, expanding security cooperation, exercises, training, and interoperability. Our investments in readiness ensure the joint force can respond when the nation calls. While we are focused on readiness for today, it is critical to modernize and lead with new concepts to prepare for tomorrow. The department continues to invest in capability and capacity to outpace our competitors while transforming from costly legacy platforms that are no longer relevant to the threat. This budget strategically invests $167.5 billion in procurement, underscoring our commitment to equip the Joint Force with unparalleled combat capabilities across every domain. This budget also invests $143.2 billion in research, development, tests, and evaluation of future capabilities that will retain our strategic edge. Finally, this budget invests significantly in nuclear modernization, digital innovation, multi-year procurement of critical munitions, and the strength in defense industrial base. With rapidly evolving threats and technologies, accelerating our modernization is crucial. Lastly, trust is the foundation of our profession. The joint force must build upon and uphold the trust in each other. Trust with our families, trust of our elected leaders, and trust of our nation. Enhancing the quality of service and the quality of life of our personnel is not just a moral obligation, it's a strategic imperative. This budget includes investments in quality of service efforts such as advanced training, educational uh, benefits, and career development, while also investing in quality of life projects like housing, medical clinics, and child care facilities, as well as funding spouse employment initiatives, enhanced mental health resources, and robust, robust programs to combat sexual assault. We must create an environment where all can reach their full potential. Trust that our joint force stands ready, ready to defend our national interest, ready to deter aggression, and ready, if necessary, to fight and win our nation's wars. I thank you for your support and collaboration and our shared commitment to face the security challenges of today and prepare for tomorrow. We are living in consequential times, and there's no time to waste. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. I recognize myself for uh, opening questions. Uh, you've, General, I addressed this first question to you. You talked about what the budget would do. 
Uh, as we know, we talked about this is a tight budget. Uh, tell me what we can't do with this budget. Tell me about some of the trade-offs that you've had to make uh, as a result of this 1% increase. Well, Chairman, I appreciate the question. As the Secretary highlighted in his, his opening uh, uh, remarks, what we had to do is uh, we focused on readiness for the near term. And it, uh, as we uh, did that, there's some areas that we did not, uh, we elected not to modernize some capabilities that would deliver in uh, later, later into the 30s. And so that's where, uh, uh, where we had to uh, address some of the uh, shortfalls in this particular budget uh, by making those, uh, those choices to focus for example, on race. For example, give me an example of something that you, de that you deferred. Uh, I'd have to get you more uh, more detail, uh, Chairman. But uh, you know, as you look at uh, various capabilities, and I would say, say uh, munitions is a key one of those uh, uh, that we uh, focus on, as well as as we look at our shipbuilding, uh, our, our uh, sub uh, uh, industrial base as well, um, and uh, air, you know um, air, aircraft. Uh, how is this How is this budget going to affect your training? Do you have a an idea about that? Well, not, not much, because we actually did focus on our readiness, and, and that's why the $147 billion is to focus on our, our readiness. Um, you know, we are very uh, uh, capable uh, joint force, and uh, using the capabilities we do have today while we you know, uh, pursue future modernization is where our focus is on uh, readiness today, uh, Chairman. Okay, I would ask this to both of you. Um, I know you've got to be concerned about this growing cooperation that we're seeing between uh, Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. Uh, do you feel like that this budget adequately resources our ability to deter their organized and unified aggressive behavior in the coming years, Mr. Secretary? Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, the, the growing nexus between uh, the PRC, Russia, uh, and, uh, and the DPRK and Iran is, uh, is concerning. And this is something that we uh, are watching very closely. Um, you know, as we look at what Russia is doing, uh, because of the, the, the damage that uh, Ukraine inflicted on Russia's land forces, Russia turned then to uh, DPRK for additional munitions and, uh, and, and, and in the form of artillery munitions and, and missiles. Um, Iran has provide, is providing uh, Russia with drone uh, capability, technology and actual drones themselves. And that's made a difference in Russia's ability to, uh, to recover from, uh, from what, you know, the damage that, the Ukraine, that Ukraine has inflicted on them. Uh, and then North Korea, again, uh, it's becoming more confident because of its, uh, its uh, affiliation with, uh, with Putin. Uh, so this is very concerning. Something that we're going to have to watch, something that, that we're going to have to make sure that we have the capability and capacity uh, to work with our allies to, uh, to uh, continue to deter and, and, and continue to promote uh, peace and stability uh, in each of the regions. But to your point, very concerning uh, and something that, uh, uh, that we're going to have to stay on top of going forward. So. General Brown. I, I would echo uh, the Secretary's comments about it being very concerning and, and watching how uh, uh, these uh, countries are uh, working and somewhat interconnected. Uh, by the same token, what I have seen in the seven months, tomorrow will be seven months I've been in the job. Um, I've engaged uh, about 170 times with uh, counterparts, my counterparts from around the world. And uh, what I've found is as the world has gotten more complex, um, our, the work with our allies and partners has strengthened. Uh, we watch how NATO is uh, has strengthened, NATO is, is larger, but as I engage with uh, you know, in, in nations in Europe, they're focused on the Indo-Pacific, and the Indo-Pacific nations are also focused on Europe because all these are uh, it's a global uh, uh, threat to all of us. And, uh, you know, that dialogue is uh, definitely increased, and I've seen that happen um, in the jobs I've held as a senior leader. When you talk to your counterparts uh, around the world, what resources would they like to see us bring uh, to the table as a part of that effort to combat or deter the behavior you just described? Well, what I, what I would highlight is uh, um, they're concerned about uh, our collective defense industrial base and bringing capability. You know, one thing I do find as I engage around the world is that U.S. capability, U.S. equipment is highly desired. And uh, we've got to be able to uh, provide that capability and equipment. And uh, th those are the things that they are, are keenly interested in. They're also interested in our ability to inter uh, uh, work and be able to interoperate, even when they have their own defense industrial base, that they're also trying to increase as well. Um, and so it's how we work together and to break down barriers um, to be able to work uh, across our industries, across our services, or across our governments uh, will be important. Thank you, General. I yield to the ranking member. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, a ton of topics we could cover. I just want to ask one, one question, and that is on recruitment and retention. I know, Secretary Austin, this has been a particular focus of yours for some time. Uh, can you update us on how we're doing? Obviously, the pandemic was a huge challenge coming out of that. There have been other challenges. Where are we at, uh, in your opinion, on being able to recruit and retain uh, the service members we need? Um, you're right, sir. I, um, COVID uh, really caused us a significant problem in our inability to get into high schools and, and uh, work the, uh, the areas that uh, we typically work uh, for, for recruiting. Um, Post-COVID, uh, we have been able to, uh, uh, to reverse those trends, get back into the high schools, to, to, to advertise in, uh, in the right markets, to reestablish contacts with centers of influence. Um, each of the services has made a concerted effort to hire the right kinds of recruiters and put the right kinds of recruiters uh, you know, out there to, to represent uh, the services, and that's, that's proving uh, to be very, very helpful. Uh, as we look at where we are right now, we see the curves beginning to bend uh, and uh, in, in favor of, uh, of you know, more, produ more productivity. Uh, I expect that uh, Army, Air Force, Space Force, and the Marines will all um, make mission uh, this year, just based upon their forecast. Uh, and I attribute that to their, their hard work. I mean, they've been, uh, they've been doing a lot to, uh, to reverse these trends. Uh, and, and you know, it's, uh, this is the tightest job market that, uh, that we've seen in a very, very long time. So uh, there's, uh, uh, there's, there are plenty of jobs for people to, uh, 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 to, to have or to get, and so this has been very competitive. But I think the services are doing the right thing. And, uh, and again, I have to uh, attribute this to their hard work and their focus. The senior leaders are focused on this in a major way, and I talk to them about, about this routinely. On top of that, retention is uh, the highest that it's, that it's been uh, uh, in a very, very long time. And so when troops uh, join us, they want to stay with us. And, and a good part of that is because of what you continue to do to help us, help resource us to uh, provide for, for them and their families. So. Thank you. Uh, General Brown here. Well, thank you. As uh, the Secretary highlighted, uh, we, we do see a positive trend. And uh, since I've been the, uh, not only as a service chief watching this and uh, coming through COVID and watching the numbers change, but also as a chairman, I've had a chance to sit down and uh, meet with uh, uh, recruiters from all of our services. I've gone to one of our processing centers to take a look and ask questions about uh, the things we can do um, to increase the, uh, the throughput uh, of our, uh, through our recruiting stations. At the same time, it's how we engage. And one of the things when I talk about trust, it's how we um, that have served, uh, what inspired us to join, and how we inspire the next generation, and how we engage and show all the opportunities um, that are, uh, are available uh, by serving in our, uh, in our force or serving uh, the nation at large. And so uh, we, we do see uh, some positive trends. And I would also say the same thing with retention. The, the numbers, we're, we're meeting all of our retention, um, and we're doing very well there. Uh, but we got to continue. We can't rest on laurels, and, and that's why the support of uh, this committee and the Congress, uh, particularly as you look at the quality of life, uh, uh, does play a role um, because it plays a role not just for the member, but it plays a role for their family as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here in your service on behalf of our country. And to me, it's so clear that the primary function of the national government is to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and that's national defense. And so your service is more important than ever. And uh, putting that in the context, too, uh, what we're talking about is deterrence of peace through strength. And so uh, what you're doing uh, could not be more important. And I particularly appreciate military service. My, uh, I have four sons who have served in Egypt, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, Iraq. Uh, my Navy son, uh, uh, the benefit of military service uh, is so exciting. My uh, son served as a Navy doctor in Naples. I now have three grandchildren who speak perfectly Italian. Uh, so I look at military service as uh, opportunity uh, to serve, but opportunity for fulfilling, fulfilling and meaningful life. And so what you're doing, and I'm so happy to hear about retention, being good, uh, Mr. Secretary, that's great. Uh, putting that in perspective, too, uh, I, your service today is more important than ever. Uh, it's been referred to uh, and bipartisan uh, with the uh, terminology uh, by uh, uh, Ranking Member Smith of uh, partnerships among uh, adversaries. 
um, the leadership that we have uh, with Chairman Mike Rogers, who stood up uh, against the dictators, and then your reference to uh, authoritarians or autocrats against democracy. I like to phrase it as dictators with rule of gun who are uh, invading democracies with rule of law. This is not a war that we chose. This is a war that war criminal Putin chose on February 24, 2022, when he invaded Ukraine and conducted mass, mass murder. Uh, this is another uh, indication with the uh, invasion by Iran with its puppets of Hamas of Israel on October 7. And we need to do all we can to deter uh, the Chinese Communist Party from an invasion of the uh, terrific country of Taiwan. With all of this in mind, uh, over and over again, um, we should be uh, grateful. And I uh, am very happy, General Brown, that this week it's reported that finally that uh, long-range attackers have been provided to the people of Ukraine to defend their country, uh, provided by Germany, the United Kingdom, and now the U.S. Additionally, I hope that cluster bombs are provided as quickly as possible. Like we have excess that need to be destroyed. I know a way to destroy them, and that is to send them to the people of Ukraine. It's been reported that War Criminal Putin is jamming various precision munitions, causing lower accuracy rates for targeting than advertised. And it's very important that we uh, equip Ukraine with the latest technology. With F-16s being provided to Ukraine by the Netherlands and Denmark, will the department be considering to have joint air to service uh, standoff missiles to be more advanced precision fires of the F-16s in the delivery package to Ukraine? General Brown. Well, as we uh, bring on the F-16s, uh, it's the, uh, uh, not only the airplanes, but it, uh, it's, it's uh, the uh, training of the uh, pilots, also training of the maintenance, but also bring sure we have the uh, weapon system to go with it. And that's part of the, uh, the conversation we're having with the countries that are not only contributing uh, F-16s, but as part of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, there is an Air Force uh, coalition that the United States is part of, and that is the dialogue that uh, we're having to uh, not only uh, just get to the airplanes, but also get it to a full capability. And uh, a, a good news, uh, Secretary Austin, in December, Japan announced it's transferring Patriot interceptors back to the U.S. to replenish our stockpiles. Earlier this month, there was a joint statement with Japan. The administration wants to pursue co-development and co-production of missiles for forward deployed in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is great for the Indo-Pacific. It really follows, um, indeed, NATO coming together with now with uh, Sweden and uh, Finland. Uh, the uh, assistance uh, by the EU, of all people, uh, for the people of Ukraine, uh, for Europe, but with the Indo-Pacific, are there other examples of defense cooperation agreements that can be pursued to deter the dictators who seek to destroy Western civilization? Well, thanks, sir. As you know, uh, we have uh, done a lot of work to strengthen our relationship with the ROK. Uh, we have uh, promoted a uh, trilateral uh, relationship between the ROK, Japan, and us. You, uh, as you witnessed uh, months, months ago, the President held a summit here in the United States uh, with those, the leadership of those three countries. Uh, we've uh, strengthened our relationship with, with uh, the Philippines. And so now we're, we, we have the ability to operate uh, uh, alongside the, the Filipinos uh, in more sites in, in the Philippines. Uh, and three years ago, uh, the leadership uh, was, uh, was going to disinvite us uh, and, and not allow us to operate in the Philippines. But that my, Hey, Mr. Secretary, my time is up. But again, it's exciting to see countries come together that, that we have not before, uh, from the Philippines to uh, Sweden and Finland. Chairman, Thank you very much. Chairman, time has expired. Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both uh, witnesses for your diligent service and your uh, testimony today. Mr. Secretary, one of the smartest actions which Congress and your department made was last year was enacting AUKUS authorities. I want to particularly compliment your legislative team who worked with a number of us on the committee to successfully steer a very complex package into last year's NDAA. As you laid out on page 16 of your testimony, it's not just an aspirational plan. AUKUS is moving out fast on many fronts. For example, I had the pleasure to welcome the first three Aussie Naval officers to sub-school at the Groton Sub Base in Connecticut, where they learned proficiency in the operation of nuclear-powered submarines, a key AUKUS Pillar 1 goal. All three, by the way, graduated in the top five of their class, and another 100 of their colleagues are going to be following in their footsteps. 
Mr. Secretary, having been on this committee for quite a while, it was quite striking to me the amount of focus in your statement on the need to grow and strengthen our nation's defense industrial base. On page 20 of your written testimony, you highlighted the department's publication last January, the National Defense Industrial Strategy, which was the first for the department to its credit. And that report honestly laid out warts and all, all the painful history of neglect of that base, which goes back decades, and acknowledged particularly the damage that procurement instability from the Pentagon has done. Coming from a district with a submarine shipyard that was decimated by such instability from 1990 to 2010, I could not agree more. Over the past 13 years, however, Congress has led the way to stabilize that yard and other yards and, and their supply chains with steady two Virginia submarine per year pro procurement, and the workforce has rebounded from a low of 9,000 to 23,000 today. COVID's pandemic did slow down production, and it's undeniable that the recovering pace needs to continue to pick up. But I would note that contra contrary to the narrative coming out of the department, starting last fall of 2023, four submarines have been or will be delivered to the Navy by the end of 2024. USS Rickover, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Iowa, and Idaho and Arkansas are slated to be delivered in 2025. The supply chain has rebounded as well, with Congress's SIB investments going back to 2018. Those investments need to continue, but so does procurement stability. Unfortunately, the 2025 budget plan has injected unexpected new instability by cutting a sub, a direct deviation from last year's fit up in the Navy's shipbuilding plan. And I would argue is also contradicts the National Defense Industrial Strategy's warning about the need to maintain procurement stability. As the Wall Street Journal powerfully noted, U.S. submarine technology is a crown jewel of America's military power and a true advantage over a rapidly expanding Chinese naval fleet. Buying only one boat is a terrible signal for capital investment, and it tells adversaries that the U.S. is not serious about rearming. I don't totally buy that last comment. But I would say that having been home since the budget came out, I've talked to supply chain companies who are hitting the pause button on planned investments. This has a real ripple effect when that signal shows instability. One of the provisions of the AUKUS authorities was uh, in the NDAA, Section 1352, is, is something that I think is really at the center of what we did last year, which is that it authorized the President of the United States to certify the sale of three Virginia-class submarines starting in 2032, 2035, and 2038. That President has to certify, when that, when that time comes, that those sales are not going to degrade our own fleet. Nobody in this room knows who, the next, who that President will be after the 2028 election. But to me, I want to make sure that that decision is as easy as possible to make sure that the goal of AUKUS is going to be achieved. Cutting a sub from the inventory, which is what this budget proposal unfortunately does, in my opinion, makes that decision harder. We're going to work hard on this committee, and my colleagues are already you know, hard at work in terms of getting requests over to the Appropriations Committee. We did it in 2007. We did it in 2013 under the Obama administration. We did it in 2020 under the Trump administration. Uh, again, I think it is so important for the, the goal of AUKUS, which again, I think is one of, gonna be one of your hallmark achievements, that we maintain procurement and we, as I said, you know, make that decision uh, in the early 2030s as early as possible. I don't have a question for you today, but uh, again, I'll, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. Mr. Chair, Austin, General Brown, um, and uh, Mr. McCord, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Secretary Austin, I, I know you are aware that last week um, our ambassador to the United States, to the United Nations, um, in conjunction with the Japanese, uh, brought forth a resolution to the UN Security Council uh, asking for. Um, all nations to prevent a dangerous nuclear arm race in outer space uh, and to um, uh, calling for a prevention of a nuclear arms race in space. This resolution was blocked, uh, vetoed by Russia and abstained by China. Um, Secretary Austin, um, what would be the effect if a nuclear device was detonated today in outer space? It would be, it would have uh, devastating uh, consequences uh, on a lot of our uh, 
uh, capabilities uh, uh, in space, not only our capabilities, but the capabilities of, uh, of other countries. Uh, and, and so uh, for that reason, we think it's irresponsible for anybody to even consider uh, deploying or imp imp and employing a nuclear device uh, in space. Well, Mr. Secretary, um, General Michael Trout of the commander of Germany's Military Space Command agrees with you. He stated the worst case scenario of an indiscriminate nuclear blast in space radiating, radiating out at a satellite frying electromagnetic pulse across low Earth orbit would be devastating, as you had said, for everyone. If somebody dares to explode a nuclear weapon in high atmosphere or even space, this would be more or less the end of the usability of that global commons of orbit. Deploying a nuclear weapon in space would also be counter to the United Nations Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Um, in addition, it would have catastrophic effects on civilian uh, use of space and our commercial use of, of space. Uh, Mr. Secretary, why would someone put a satellite in space that has nuclear capabilities to detonate a weapon in space as opposed to just use a missile or an ICBM to detonate a nuclear weapon in space? Certainly uh, a device like that would have, uh, could have uh, a much more extensive impact and, co and cover more, uh, more uh, ground, for lack of a better term, uh, with one device uh, than a uh, an anti-satellite anti uh, uh, weapon, which is you know, directed towards a specific uh, target. Now, this thing would, uh, would take away large swaths of capability. Uh, and, and as you pointed out, not just uh, our capability, but, uh, but also allies and partners. And, uh, and, and, and so um, we don't really fully know or understand what uh, what the full effects would be it would it would depend upon you know the yield of the weapon uh, the orbit that it was in and, and all those things but uh, but certainly it would Mr. Secretary, uh, it wouldn't one of the reasons why they'd put it in space as opposed to shoot an ICBM or missile is because um, an ICBM or missile could be attributed as a nuclear weapons attack on a country and would have a, a, res a nuclear weapons response that, that's right. If it was a, uh, a an attack on on one of our terrestrial uh, capabilities, uh, sure. But it, there's also they also have the opportunity or the ability to use a uh, ground launch capability to attack a satellite and take out uh, some uh, capability that's on orbit. Mr. Secretary, uh, John Plum, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, told reporters on um, April 5th that Washington was in discussions with Russia about the weapons plans and apparent confirmation that Moscow is at least engaging on the topic. Um, is, is Russia developing an, an anti-satellite weapon with nuclear capabilities? Um, and certainly, I, I uh, would not want to get into a discussion of uh, intelligence uh, uh, information in an open hearing, but certainly we can, we can have that discussion. Uh, right. So, Mr. Secretary, the reason why I ask you the question and the reason why you're stumbling is because the Biden administration refused to declassify this information. So we're not able to have an open public discussion. But one thing I'm concerned about is that, Mr. Secretary, in your entire um, a written testimony, you never mention anti-satellites as a threat. You certainly don't even mention nuclear weapons as a threat, but the administration's moving forward trying to get the UN Security Council to take action. I believe that this is a, the Cuban Missile Crisis in space, and this administration is sleepwalking itself into an international crisis. And I certainly want to encourage you to encourage the administration to declassify this and take every actions necessary to avoid this space race uh, that could, as the, our ambassador to the United Nations says, be a nuclear weapons space race. Gentleman's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you. I'd, my colleague from Connecticut talked about cutting a sub. Uh, we make choices here, as you do at the Department of Defense also. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on December 9th, 2022, you gave a speech where you said, Nuclear deterrence isn't just a numbers game, and, th and that thinking can spur an arms race. You stress the importance of working to reduce the global role of nuclear weapons, which we just heard from our colleague, and I happen to agree. For years, I've questioned the viability and the premise of the Sentinel program. In December, the Department of Defense announced 
that the ever-escalating cost of the Sentinel program, now estimated that at least $137 billion, had breached the critical non recurring limit. And that by law, the program must be terminated unless you, Mr. Secretary, certify that the program is, one, essential to national security, two, that there are no alternatives to the program, three, that the new cost estimates are reasonable, and four, that the program is a higher priority than programs whose funding must be reduced. Am I correct in saying that you are aware of your task that lies ahead? I am, sir. I'm pleased to hear that, because even without the required analysis by law that the Sentinel program, far too many Pentagon leaders have said, and I quote, the Sentinel will be funded, we'll make the trades. Mr. Secretary, can you assure us that you will require that a truly fulsome and critical analysis of the Sentinel program will be made and that the alternatives, for example, a submarine, will not be funded so that the Sentinel program can go ahead? I, I can assure you that uh, we will um, conduct a thorough analysis uh, in accordance with the uh, Nunn-McCurdy uh, Act responsibilities and the responsibilities that you've outlined uh, uh, um, as well. So. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I believe you have until sometime in July to make that decision, and along the course in early May or late May, you will, General Brown, provide to the committees the analysis required by law. Is that correct? We will. We'll, we'll support the timeline to, to uh, enable the Secretary to uh, uh, make his uh, determination. Uh, in your opening remarks, General Brown, you said that, quote, our investment in nuclear capabilities reflects a judicious balance between advancing cutting-edge technologies and phasing out legacy capabilities. Fourth grade math would indicate that at $700 million a copy, $137 billion can buy you somewhere more than 120 B-21 bombers complete with an ISRO. Or perhaps seven Columbia-class submarines for $137 billion choices to be made here. Is an attack submarine important? Is an additional 120 or so B-21 bombers, complete with an LSRO, important? More important than a Sentinel? Can the Minuteman III be life extended? And by the way, committee members, why do we consistently write into the NDAA that there must be 400 ICBMs? There's been no analysis to indicate that. And has the Joint Requirements Office Oversight Council actually revisited the military requirements necessary for the nuclear enterprise? Has that been done, General Brown? That is part of their task is to continue, not just on the nuclear portfolio, but uh, across all of our portfolios for um, our joint warfighters. I await that analysis. I yield back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Austin, your written testimony says that the fiscal year 25 budget invests in air and missile defense systems, which will, quote, preserve our ability to deploy combat credible forces when needed, unquote. However, the Missile Defense Agency's budget you delivered to Congress was almost $1 billion below fiscal year 24 budget projections. It canceled, cut, or delayed several munitions programs. 
In fact, the day after I protested these cuts recently to the director of the Missile Defense Agency, Iran la launched a direct and massive attack on Israel that included over 100 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, and 150 attack drones. Yet we have limited stocks and we have allies and friends who are desperate for us to give them some of our limited stocks. So why did the department choose these drastic cuts to missile defense at a time when we need it more than ever to protect our homeland and our allies and partners? Well, thank you, sir. As, we stated, as I stated earlier, uh, because of the FRA, uh, we did have to make uh, some choices, and they were always tough choices. Uh, and we recognize that, uh, that, that uh, we needed to invest in uh, current, uh, current readiness, and we put a $147 billion request on the table to do that. Uh, and uh, going forward, uh, we will uh, invest in those things that we weren't able to invest in in this budget uh, if we get support for an increased top line in the out years. So. Okay, uh, the chairman asked you both specifically to give an example of something that's been deferred, and I've got one here I'd like to refer to. The budget you've submitted also delays the glide phase interceptor. This would be a defense against hypersonic weapons until after 2035. That's 11 years from now. And yet they have this capability today, Russia and China both, especially China. So how is this meeting the threat of hypersonics when we have this threat staring at us today to, to put it off till 2035? Yeah, again, for those... Uh capabilities that uh, those investments that, that wouldn't deliver capabilities until after 2030 uh, for this current uh, budget, we decided to, uh, to not invest in that, but uh, invest in that in later years. So. Well, um, thank you for clarifying that, but I'm thinking we need to re-examine. Sure there's, sure, there's a lot of priorities here, but this is one we've got to re-examine. Um, also, changing gears to nuclear deterrence, when the Biden administration came into office, one of its first acts was to offer an unconditional five-year extension on the New START Treaty. I believe this was a short-sighted gift to Vladimir Putin. According to the State Department, Russia is now in its second consecutive year of violating the New START Treaty. And last year, the Strategic Posture Commission, a bipartisan a uh, committee composed of great experts published its report that described the current nuclear modernization program of record as being necessary but insufficient given China's breathtaking increase in nuclear capability. Uh, General Brown, I'll ask you this one. So neither Russia or China are appearing at all interested in coming to the negotiating table and yet we now have the growth of a third nuclear superpower in, the, in this world. So a new START treaty is probably going to expire in three years without being renewed by the Russia and the U.S. What should we be doing to prepare for that eventuality? Thanks for the question. And what I would say is... Uh, what we need to do is not only thinking about the treaty, and I realize that will be a policymakers, but from my perspective as a, uh, as a chairman, as a warfighter, is making sure we are getting capability um, in, in our nuclear portfolio, but also our conventional uh, portfolio. I sat down with the, the Strategic Posture uh, Commission. We talked not only about our nuclear portfolio, but also our conventional capabilities as well. And what's really important to be able to do that is to uh, have uh, consistent funding, uh, consistent demand signal, um, to uh, provide uh, that, that capability as we work with our defense industrial base. And those are the things uh, we'll, we'll need to do. As the Secretary of Highlight, we're, we're right now we're focused on readiness based on the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, but as we look uh, to the out years, we do need to focus on not only uh, get, you know, identifying the capability, but giving it consistent funding and then being able to accelerate that capability into the hands of our, our warfighters. Okay, well, th well, thank you both. Uh, we are addressing some of the immediate needs right now, I believe, in a good way but we really need to look at these out years for what's going to be coming down uh, later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, and to the witnesses for being here today and certainly for your service to our nation. Uh, in your opening remarks, and quite often prior to this, uh, we've talked about the American defense industrial base. And certainly coming out of the pandemic and since then with the wars raging, uh, primarily in Ukraine, we've seen 
the imbalance that we are having in the industrial base, that we have those risks in the supply production and the delivery. Uh, and certainly you have started and we must have a, what I would call more aggressive uh, posture in order to build that up. Uh, because not only does it need to be resilient and reliable, it also needs to be affordable. And certainly starting from behind the finish line, uh, building that up in a quick way is usually not the most efficient. So to date, and this would go to you, Secretary Austin, is what has the department done from where we started a few years ago on this quick uh, and immediate need to build up in particular, our munitions space. Could you elaborate on some of the steps we've taken? Yeah, in, in order to maintain our competitive edge, we're, we're going to have to continue to invest uh, in, in munitions, uh, and, um, and, and we, we're doing that. We've done that uh, with your help. As you know, for, the, for 24, we asked you for uh, a number of uh, multi-year procurement authorities, uh, and you supported us with that request. Uh, and uh, over the last three years or so, we've invested uh, north of $75 billion uh, in munitions, uh, which, uh, and it's, uh, I might add, in a supplemental that, uh, that you just uh, approved for us, uh, there, there are resources in that supplemental that help, uh, that, we, that we apply to the uh, industrial base and help them expand to increase their capacity so to meet the current demand and the demand in the future. Uh, so I want to thank you, thank all the members for that. Uh, but we, we put a lot of work into uh, working with industry leaders to, you know, to uh, increase, uh, increase capacity, increase capability, and, and again, with your help, uh, that's, uh, that's been very effective. Now, we also need to work with allies and partners uh, to increase international uh, capacity as well. And my, uh, uh, my undersecretary for acquisition and sustainment uh, is leading the charge to work with other, other countries uh, to, uh, to promote uh, them expanding their industrial base as well. Even after everything is all said and done, as you know, we're going to have to make sure we're producing enough capability uh, to help allies and partners who've dug deep uh, in support of Ukraine and, and, and other things, help them replenish their stocks after we've replenished our stocks as well. So. Well, certainly appreciate that. And sending the right signals to industry so that they are prepared is incredibly important. And that leads me to the next question. The assessment and how we're going to manage at some point, hopefully sooner than later, that we are going to build not only our stocks up to the tune of 50 billion under the aid package, but to help our allies and partners. How are we going to send the correct signals to industry that when we meet that, it's just not going to drop off. Uh, Mr. Courtney talked about the submarine base of years ago and what happened that when we abruptly stopped. How are we going to manage our munitions base that we're building up now, but when we backfill, how are we going to handle that? Well, it's some, some, uh, certainly something that, uh, that we are focused on and, and we will continue to work with, with industry on. Um, there's certainly when the, when the demand uh, shrinks a bit, uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we have to have a capability to rapidly expand uh, if required. Now, there, the way that we produce uh, munitions, the way that, the way that we uh, design production lines, all of those things have to be taken into account. Maybe there are things that we can compress uh, uh, so that we can rapidly expand when called upon to do that. But those are things that, uh, that we're taking a hard look at, and, uh, um, and industry uh, has been very supportive. Uh, uh, thus far, and we, I expect that they'll be supportive going forward. We got to send the right signal to them to, your, to the point that you're making. Certainly, uh, and we also have to look at the reserve munitions that we've had in the past and say, is that ad adequate given the way that Ukraine and other areas of the world have really operated in the last six months to two years? Uh, certainly, th that is incredibly important, and I yield back. I thank, thank the you. gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman for Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Thanks so much for your service to our nation. General Brown, I, I want to discuss the cost and exchange ratios between 
our weapons and weapons of our adversaries. You know, I've talked all the time about the way we win this competition is we have to get more per our dollar than the Chinese get per their yuan or the Russians get per their ruble. And unfortunately today, that's not the case. I know you've supported CCAs and, and, and that sort of uh, accumulation of mass where we can do quickly. I think that is absolutely where we need to be. I want to talk a little bit about the unit costs of where we are today. The unit cost for an SM-6 missile is $4 million. The unit cost for a Shahid-136, the kamikaze-style drone that is being used by Iran against Israel, being used by the Russians against Ukraine, is $50,000 a copy. I'm not a mathematician, but this is not sustainable. I want to show the other slide, too, where we talk about the annual production for SM-6 missiles. In the United States, we build 125 SM-6 missiles a year. If you look at the production of the Shahid-136, 6,000 a year. I'm not a mathematician, but this math just doesn't add up. There's no way that we can counter, both in mass and in cost, what we're seeing from our adversaries. And this is in many other areas around the world, and we've seen this, this developing capability. I want to make sure that we're doing more to do the right thing to counter these threats. I want to know, why does, why does the Joint Staff, using the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, continue to support exquisite requirements in the face of these expendable platforms that our adversaries are using? Listen, we're going to go Winchester really fast, not just on ammunition, but also on money. Tell me, tell me, how are we getting to a point of where we are able to counter these Class Three UAVs with mass and affordability? Well, I appreciate your question because I'm in the uh, same spots you are. And that's why I often talk about the, uh, we have to have capability and capacity. It's one thing to have high-end capability but limited capacity or low-end capability with a lot of capacity. And we've got to be able to balance across that. And so uh, the examples you used on the, for the SM6, uh, particularly in, in you look at the events that happened on the, on the 13th of this month, uh, we used a, a combination of capabilities to include air-to-air -air missiles, AIM-9X's uh, AIM and AIM-120's. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've got to have a range of capabilities in, in addition to non-kinetic capability, directed energy. Uh, and so that's where my focus is as the chairman. And uh, I, I am very much focused with the JROC that, to change that perspective to ensure that we are not just focused on this high-end capability, but we focus on a range of capabilities to ensure we have uh, uh, all, uh, many opportunities and options um, that are uh, cost effective against the, uh, the threat. Very good. Thank you. Secretary Austin, President Biden has said in the past that we will defend Taiwan if they are attacked by China. In your estimation, do we have the capability and capacity today to adequately equip our forces to pursue this mission of defending Taiwan? Our, our, uh, our military is the most powerful military on the planet, uh, and not only do, uh, do we have more capability than anyone else we, in, in terms of the ability to, uh, to use uh, what we have on hand and to integrate uh, fires and to, and to maneuver responsibly uh, and effectively, we also work with allies and partners and increase their capability as well. You've seen us do that pretty effectively uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific thus far. And we continue to build upon that. AUKUS was mentioned earlier. This is a, a, uh, an incredible capability that's, uh, that's a, a game changer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it will certainly add to, uh, to the overall uh, deterrence in the, in the theater. Uh, but there are a number of examples like that throughout. So. Let, me, let me drill down a little bit further. When we look at what we're going to face in that theater, we're going to be operating in a highly contested environment, which means we have to be able to reach Chinese assets at long range in order to degrade that environment to a contested environment where we have a much, much better advantage. Tell me, where are we with magazine depth and capability and capacity currently with long range precision strike weaponry in that theater? Well, we, we uh, again, I think when you look at, uh, at our capability, I think we're, we're in a pretty good place. We never have uh, everything that we want, but certainly it's, it's the mix of capabilities that's, that's important here. Uh, and, uh, and that's our goal, to make sure that we have the right mix of capabilities to, to ensure that we can be effective. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Kana. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for your service to our nation. 
President Sisi of Egypt has said that an invasion of Rafah would have catastrophic consequences, both for the humanitarian situation and for broader regional peace and security. President Abbas has said, quote, it would be the biggest catastrophe in the Palestinian people's history. And yet this morning I read that Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying, with or without a hostage deal, he plans to go in to Rafah. Mr. Secretary, we're the greatest nation in the world. We're the most powerful nation in the world. This is not a time for vague ambiguities. Will you please commit today and send a clear message to Mr. Netanyahu that he should not go in to Rafa? What we have uh, emphasized uh, throughout uh, is that we, th they must do um, what's necessary to protect the civilians in, in the battle space. Uh, a much better job of what we've seen thus far. And as you know, there are uh, north of a million uh, civilians that have moved into that space that if, they're, if you're going to conduct operations, then, then those civilians must be accounted for and hopefully moved out of, moved out of the area. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, we, if, if they were going to conduct uh, operations, we want to see a different approach uh, to those operations as well. Uh, but uh, thus far, we've not seen uh, the civilians moved out of the battle space. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, what they have said is that uh, their operations will be sequential, where they uh, account, and account for the civilians and move the civilians uh, out of harm's way uh, before they would... Uh, Let me ask you this, Mr. Secretary. Is there, would you oppose it if you don't see a plan? If tomorrow he goes in without a plan, would you oppose that? Of course I would. Yeah. And would there be consequences in that case if Netanyahu goes in without a plan? Uh, the consequences, of course, that, that would be determined by the president. So. Would it be on the table to stop offensive weapons if he did that? Again, those, that's determined by the president. So. What would be your military advice if I, he did that? I'll never share my military advice uh, that I give to the president with, uh, with anyone. So. Let me ask this, though. You would, you would certainly oppose it without a plan. Do you, in your years, and I, you know how much respect I have for you and your service, do you really believe that there is a conceivable plan of evacuation that would save civilian lives and allow Netanyahu to go into Rafah? Could you come up with such a plan? I, I could, and, and, uh, but it, it takes time. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, we, we see some signs that, uh, that, that, that they are moving towards that direction, uh, but in terms of uh, all of the things that need to come, that need to take place before, uh, you know, an attack happens. Uh, we, we've not seen um, a number of things that we believe that, that will have to happen before. What, what are those things that you think need to happen in terms of a plan that would give you confidence that civilian lives would be protected? And, and they have a plan. Uh, the question is, can you execute? Are, are you executing the plan, and, and uh, how much time are you allocating for what it? What are the mo main concerns you have of what you've, either the lack of plan or lack of execution? That lack of execution. And what, what, what would be the specific specifics of what you would want to see that they're not doing today? Uh, making prov provisions for the, uh, for the civilians, wh wherever you direct them to. Do you, do you have sustainment uh, uh, in that area? Um, you know, do, do you have the ability to, to move them from where they are now to, uh, to wherever you're going to direct them to? Uh, and then are, are you willing to protect them a, as you do that? So, uh, you know, the, the housing, the, uh, uh, the medical care, all that stuff that, that uh, needs to be in place. Um, you know, we, we've seen some signs that, uh, that some of that's coming together, but, uh, but clearly not. And where, where would they move these million people to? So you're saying before they go into Rafah, they would need to move all the million people out of Rafah who are civilians? I, I doubt that they'll move all of them out, but uh, certainly the preponder, preponderance of the people, uh, sure. And I, but what, they, let's they can only go north. Because if like, and I let my times is almost expire. I mean, if there are two, three hundred thousand left, I mean, do you have a sense if they were to go in, how many debts, civilian debts we're talking about? Or, I mean, if they were to go in? Well, there have been far too many deaths, uh, civilian deaths already. Uh, and uh, we certainly, uh, if they were to go in, we certainly would want to see uh, things done in a much different way. Uh, and, and the number of civilian deaths would, would depend upon what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, but again, um, 
the, the two things aren't the gentleman's time's exclusive. expired chair and i recognize the gentleman from georgia mr scott thank you mr chairman i ask unanimous consent unanimous consent to submit for the record an article from financial times dated april 28 2024 Without objection, so ordered. Titled, Western Banks in Russia paid 800 million euro in taxes to the Kremlin last year. Figures represent a fourfold increase on pre-war levels and come as profits jump at European lenders still in the country. And uh, Mr. McCord, I know you've gotten away without questions, but since your degree is economics and with a master's in public policy, I'm gonna come to you with part of this. Um, in this article, one of the paragraphs reads, Western lenders have benefited from the imposition of sanctions on most of the Russian financial sector, which has denied access to the SWIFT international interbank payment system. That made international banks a financial lifeline between Moscow and the West. Secretary Austin, when you uh, started, you said this is a choice between democracy and autocracy. I agree with you 100%. Um, Russia has faced sanctions from the U.S. and our European allies. Uh, those sanctions have in many ways been ignored. Uh, India has certainly bought oil from them, skirting sanctions, and, and we talk about China. We expect that from China. Uh, I would have hoped that India would have supported um, democracy a little better than they have. Uh, my question, Secretary McCord, is uh, how did the Department of Defense and U.S. interagency partners and the militaries of our European allies coordinate to ensure the sanctions enforcement? And how does Ukraine win if the sanctions are not enforced and Russia's economy is allowed to continue to grow? Uh, Mr. Scott, I would say from the start, the administration's approach on Ukraine has been emphasized interagency. Treasury and state in particular have the lead on, on some of the items you mentioned, export controls and sanctions. But we we have mm. between military assistance, you know, security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian, export controls and, and sanctions app applied that whole of government approach. Uh, you're citing, I think, some of the if you will, human nature uh, problems that you have of incentives around the world to, to try and evade these uh, for, for individualized gain, perhaps. But uh, I know that uh, Treasury in particular has worked hard to, uh, to, to have an have a effective regime on Let the me, front. I'm, half my time's gone, Mr. McCord. I appreciate your answer. I, I, I respectfully disagree with you. I think that the Biden administration could have could have done more to enforce the sanctions, and I think that our European partners could have done more to enforce the sanctions, and I think that if Russia's economy was not growing, then Russia would not have been able to reconstitute its military and its military industrial base the way they would have, and it, and, and it would not be costing uh, the Ukrainians what it is in, in, in people, and it would not be costing the world what it is in, in support financially and with weapons if the sanctions had been enforced. Uh, General, General Brown, what is the impact on the battle space when sanctions are not enforced? Well, you know, not being an economist, but being a warfighter, uh, anyway, I think the key part I would highlight to you is the uh, uh, access to capability on, on either side. And uh, th that can determine the, uh, the outcome of a, a military uh, conflict. The, the quantity and the quality of the weapons that your opponent has because of the money they have. Is, is that a safe answer? That's a fair statement. That's my concern with the sanctions not being enforced, not just by the Biden administration, but by our European partners as well. Um, do you have the necessary authorities to take military action against the shadow fleet uh, of vessels that's illegally transporting Russian oil and, and, and funding Vladimir Putin's war? Uh, that, that is not something that we are, uh, from an authority uh, standpoint, that we are, uh, you know, as a military, um, uh, focused on right now. I mean, we've been focused on supporting Ukraine, um, and we work uh, closely with the interagency on how we identify uh, to address. Uh, uh, I, I, have, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you, General Brown, and, and you too, as well, Secretary Austin. But I will tell you, supporting Ukraine means defeating Vladimir Putin in Russia. And if we're going to defeat, defeat Vladimir Putin in Russia, then we have to do two things. One is we have to enforce the sanctions so that his economy will fail and he cannot continue to, to reconstitute his military and build the weapons that he is and supply the weapons that he is. And, and the other thing is we've got to be willing to punch him back inside Russian territory. 
And so when I see uh, a Biden administration that won't enforce the sanctions and our European allies not enforcing the sanctions, and then when Ukraine hits Russia in Russia, Biden's saying, please don't do that anymore. If Jim's that's a problem. Expired. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our uh, country's leaders in defense for their service. Uh, eight days ago, uh, I was in, uh, at the Polish uh, Ukraine border visiting with our 82nd Airborne. We were doing uh, a logistical job that no other country in the world uh, could do uh, and thank them for their service. Seven days ago, uh, I spent nearly an hour in, in Kyiv with President Zelensky. Uh, during that time, we had a far-reaching conversation, but time and time again, the, uh, the most important thing he hammered in to all of us, there's only four of us, bipartisan group, but uh, was the need for air defense. You know, in, in Ukraine, they have an air defense. Uh, in Kyiv, their second largest city was getting pummeled as we sat there, Kharkiv, uh, with major attacks. Uh, he thanked us for uh, the supplementary package, but can you tell us what uh, we're able to do to help Ukraine's air defense? They're a resilient country. They're producing their own armaments in the midst of a war. Uh, but what can we do to improve that uh, air defense? Well, certainly, uh, thanks, sir. And first of all, thanks for, uh, for visiting and, uh, and thanks for your support uh, and along with all your colleagues to get, uh, to get the supplemental approved. That, uh, that was a big uh, measure of assurance to, uh, to our, our colleagues there in, uh, in Ukraine and to uh, our, our allies in, uh, in NATO. Um, so as you know, um, I, I convene some 50 countries uh, every month to talk about uh, uh, how we're going to continue to provide uh, uh, so, uh, security assistance to Ukraine at scale and speed. Uh, air defense has, been, has long been one of the things that we have emphasized over and over again. When people were talking about other capabilities, we continue to emphasize that this is what Ukraine needs most. And that's playing itself out to be true because we watch Russia uh, continue to launch uh, missiles that have been supplied by, uh, by you know, uh, uh, North Korea drones that have been supplied hey, by. I'm by, sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, sir, by, uh, do we have the assets uh, in place? The, the, you know, Patriots missile systems in particular uh, among that 56 member group to to do more we, uh, in immediate sense. There are countries that have patriots, and so what, what we're doing is continuing to engage those countries. I have uh, talked to the leaders of several countries, uh, you know, myself, here in the last two weeks, uh, encouraging them to, uh, to give up more capability and, or provide more capability, and, uh, and so we're going to stay with us. Uh, and, and, you know, I talk to the Minister of Defense uh, of Ukraine every week. Uh, and so, you know, he, he is clearly aware of what, uh, what we're doing, engaging others, and looking around the world to try to get a, additional capability. But well, well, you have our commitment and my commitment as I talk to our ally leaders, which I do several of them every week in, in my two capacities and committees. So uh, I'll continue to emphasize to them the importance of doing that, too. One other quick question. You, just to exp expand a little bit on what Representative uh, uh, Khanna had just said, uh, few people in the world, I think, know as much as you do uh, about uh, the difficulties and challenges of urban warfare. Uh, uh, I think, I believe you have, and I know the President has talked about lessons learned that we've learned as a country ourselves. Uh, you, you talked about some of the military logistical issues. Can you just briefly in the short time here, there are other issues too in lessons learned uh, in those types uh, of warfare situations, uh, and they affect the civilian population too. Can you just briefly tell us what you've learned? It's clearly one of the lessons that we've learned is, is that uh, you, you have to make sure you're doing uh, all you can to uh, protect uh, civilians. Uh, and, and because if you don't, then, uh, then uh, you'll create a longer term problem for yourself as, uh, as some of those uh, civilians then, then turn against you in the future. And, and so uh, we've emphasized that a number of times to our colleagues and, and continue to do so. And I talked, I talked to uh, my counterpart in, uh, in Israel on a weekly basis. We've talked some 40 times since, uh, 40 plus times since uh, October 7th. And these are things that we continue to hammer home. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's an imperative. 
Yeah, and I must say, uh, your constant uh, efforts uh, all through this, uh, given the fact you overcame some of your own health issues, is really extraordinary. And I want to thank you for that, and I yield back. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the witnesses for their service and appearing here today. Uh, General Brown, has the need for land-based leg of the nuclear tri triad decreased since the decision was made in 2014 to recapitalize the ICBM fleet? Uh, no, it is not. Okay. Um, since that time, China has undertaken what multiple STRATCOM commanders have described as a breathtaking expansion of their nuclear arsenal, including a massive investment in silo-based ICBMs. Do you think that that strengthens the case for modernizing our ICBM fleet? Uh, it does, and I, I would say just uh, when you th think about our, our complete nuclear portfolio, not only our ICBMs, but also with our, uh, our uh, maritime-based uh, capabilities, but also our bombers, all, all those play a role. Uh, particularly when you think about the aspect of uh, not only you have a PRC that's advancing, but you also have uh, Russia uh, as a uh, nuclear threat as well. Okay. So to be clear, it's your best military advice that we'll need an ICBM capability for the for foreseeable future. Is that correct? It is, because they, that, 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 it's all part of the triad, and each part of the triad actually plays a, a key role to ensure that we're able to uh, not only our strategic deterrence, but the extended deterrence it provides for uh, our allies and partners as well. Good, thank you. Uh, Secretary Austin, I agree with your sentiments that Ukraine is morally right in its resistance against Vladimir Putin and the Russian army. However, I don't think that alone should guarantee United States assistance to carry on this fight in perpetuity without any clear, coherent plan or strategy. And these feelings are shared by my constituents in Tennessee, and I think their frustration is building as the question of what the end game is here continues to go unanswered. Can you help us today describe how things are going to turn out better in, in the upcoming eight months. We're over two years into this war. Uh, we've uh, contributed a lot of money. We've just approved another $61 billion. How do you see this playing out over the next six or eight months? Yeah, we, uh, thank you, sir, and, th and thanks for your support uh, with the supplemental. Um, we, we've been clear from the very beginning that what we want to see is a democratic, independent, and sovereign Ukraine that has the means to defend itself uh, and, uh, and deter aggression uh, going forward. Now, there are some things uh, in, in the immediate term that I believe that Ukraine needs to, needs to be able to do. One is to maintain access to, uh, to the Black Sea, uh, because uh, as you've seen here recently, they have, uh, they have managed to continue to export grain, uh, uh, you know, using the Black Sea corridor. Uh, they also have to defend uh, uh, in, the, in the north and east, where uh, we see Russia mounting uh, in, uh, increased uh, uh, small attacks and, and probably uh, maybe are looking to mount a larger attack in the north and east. That's their industrial base, so they have to, they have to support that. And then, and then the, the third thing I think uh, they need to do is, is to uh, place uh, additional pressure on Crimea. As you know, Crimea, Russia is using Crimea as, uh, uh, as kind of a transit zone to, to push up um, supplies and, uh, and personnel in support of their efforts in southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine. So uh, again, our, our overall goal is to make sure that uh, Ukraine, uh, at the end of the day, remains a democratic, independent, and sovereign uh, state that can defend itself. Okay. And that doesn't really answer the question as far as a strategy, and maybe I didn't ask it directly enough, but I mean, as far as an end game, do we see a, a peace settlement? Do we see outright victory? How long will it be before they come back to the well? We just did 61 billion. Uh, you know, there's been a lot more prior to that. Uh, what can we tell people? I mean, I, the president actually did try to explain this a little bit last week in response to the aid package. He was on TV or at least a visible press conference where he tried to describe it. We've been imploring the DOD and the administration to tell the American people why this is so important, why this investment is there. So what is, in your opinion, the end game timeline? When will it be needing more money? And you know, what's victory look like? As is the case with uh, most uh, conflicts of this type, uh, it ends in, with some sort of uh, uh, negotiation, uh, and, uh, and again, uh, if that happens, when that happens, 
Uh, we want Ukraine to be in the best possible position to be able to, to uh, achieve uh, its goals uh, and, and negotiate uh, uh, for, for the right things. Uh, it, it's up to Ukraine when that happens uh, and, and, and what, they, what they choose to, uh, to agree to or not to. Uh, our goal is to make sure that they have the security assistance to be able to uh, continue their fight to protect our sovereign territory. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair and I recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Lutkin. Hi, Mr. Secretary, Chairman, um, Mike. Good to see you all. Um, uh, I'm, I want to ask a question a little bit different than my peers um, that comes from uh, uh, looking forward at threats. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, you know, your job as the Secretary is to deal with everything that's going on in the world, and it's, it's messy right now, but also to look at future threats. Um, and I want to put on the table um, this idea that the United States is poised to let in a huge flood of Chinese electric vehicles into the United States. In the European Union, they let in their first Chinese EV in 2021. They now have almost 25% market share. So all the cameras, light detection, um, LIDAR, excuse me, radar, data collection, cameras, all the stuff that we have concerns about even putting on our military vehicles, right? Chinese origin um, equipment we would never put on our military vehicles are now poised to be flooded into the United States, driving around everywhere, collecting data on our military bases, on our key infrastructure. Um, as someone who develops our war plans on other states, you can imagine how interesting that data might be to adversaries. Um, so I, I have a few questions. I asked similar ones to the Secretary of the Army when she was here. Um, they're not gotcha questions. I'm just, I'm a CIA officer who is trying to process um, that we, you know, we're concerned about data, you know, who owns the data of a thing like TikTok and the idea of a fleet of vehicles coming into the United States collecting all this data that's housed and handled by the Chinese Communist Party really bothers me um, as a national security issue. So I have just a series of questions. They're not gotcha questions. They're just legitimately, you know, would we want a potential adversary to have high fidelity 3D maps of every military base and installation in the country? We, we would def definitely not want that. Would we want a potential adversary to have high fidelity maps of infrastructure such as power plants, ports, highways, and bridges? Absolutely not. Would we want any potential adversary to hack into ground vehicles and pilot it remotely or disable a vehicle no. in the United States? No. Would we want a potential adversary to be conducting cyber espionage, collecting sensitive intelligence through any phone or Bluetooth enabled device on a ground vehicle? No. Okay, you, you, you get my point here. I think the, the thing that I'm concerned about um, is that um, the United States, we're a free market economy, we value that, we're good capitalists, um, but in today's day and age, some of the most dangerous collection goes on through commercial means. And obviously, I'm from Michigan. You don't have to guess why I'm asking about this, um, um, because we are making the American vehicles where the data is housed here. Um, we asked for a report from the Department of Defense a year ago about the national security implications of Chinese connected vehicles. We have not gotten that report. Um, I know your, your um, congressional affairs people are behind you. I'd ask that we actually see that report because this is about preventing future threats, not just dealing with uh, the admitted mess that we have around the world. Um, um, set, changing gears, um, uh, I just have to ask, we had General Carrillo, the head of CENTCOM, here in front of our committee a few weeks ago, and I asked him, as one of our most decorated officers who got shot three times in Mosul, has served in Iraq, has served in tough places, what is the military strategy for Rafa? Can you articulate the Israeli military strategy for going into Rafa? I'd have to let the Israelis articulate that strategy. Have they provided it to you? Um, uh, we've, we've gotten uh, some concepts, but uh, in terms of detailed okay, plans. Okay, so no, we haven't gotten the military plan. For the, the pier that's being set up, as I understand it, as many as 1,000 U.S. uniformed officers are going to be involved in setting up that pier. A smaller number will be resident there. If we are shot at, if more artillery um, is shot at us, who is responding and with what um, operating procedures is that military responding? Yeah, I've, uh, General Brown and I have spent... Uh, quite a bit of time with uh, General Carrillo working through our 
our force protection plan, and I'm confident that uh, he's put the right measures in place. Will the Israelis be responding if the United States is shot at? This, the Israelis uh, will, will provide uh, additional security in the area. That's right. I just think, given the differences I think we have with the Israelis on civilian casualties, we better be, get right clear about what the response is going to be when we are shot at, since I don't think many Americans feel that it reflects the same values that we have here. Thanks very much. Yeah, ladies, time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Let's stay on the same subject. Ms. Slotkin just said there'll be about 1,000 U.S. service members operating a peer system off of Gaza. How many of them will have guns, Mr. Secretary? Well, typically all of the uh, deployed service, member carry, uh, service members carry guns, and they have the ability to protect themselves if, if challenged. So if someone from land in Gaza shoots at our service members who are on the $320 million pier that we're building, you're telling me our service members can shoot back? They, they, have, the, they have the right to, uh, to return fire to protect themselves. Now, Well, now do we again, think that's like, so now I want to move to the likelihood that you think someone from land in Gaza might shoot at our service members on this pier. Do you think that that's a likely scenario? That's possible, yes. This is a very telling moment, Mr. Secretary, because you've said something that's quite possible that could happen, right? Shots from Gaza on our service members, and then the response, our armed service members shooting live fire into Gaza. That is a possible outcome here so that we can become the port authority and run this pier, right? Uh, th th that's correct. You know, I, I expect that we will always Don't have the ability to protect ourselves. Don't you think that counts as boots on the ground? President Biden told the country that we weren't going to have boots on the ground in Gaza. And we and, won't. Okay, but you guys parse the distinction between, like when Americans think boots on the ground, they think Americans in harm's way or engaged actively in a conflict. You guys seem to be sort of um, saying that boots on a pier connected to the ground Connected to service members shooting into Gaza doesn't count as boots on the ground? It, it does not. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to find the, the American people have a different perspective on that. And if we're going to have people shooting into Gaza, we probably should have a vote on that pursuant to our war powers. But I want to bring us now closer to home and the F-35 program. Is the F-35 program a failure? No. it's. Uh, okay, so let's go over how much does an F-35 cost? Well, it depends on the variant. but uh, 100 million? Safe, safe to say, 100 million a copy? Okay, so we just had the Air Force in here, and I said, what percentage of these F-35s are fully mission capable? And they said 29%. Do you have any basis to disagree with that assessment? I don't have any basis to disagree okay. with the Secretary. So at 100 million a copy, 29% being fully mission capable, does that seem low to you? It's a complex uh, airframe, and, and again, um, there are a number of reasons why a platform could be in, uh, not operational at any one given time. But, well, right, but I mean, but how many... Having said that, it, I, is a, it is probably it is one of the best aircraft in the inventory. The best aircraft in the inventory? Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, there's a GAO report that takes a very different view. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter the GAO report entitled, F-35 sustainment cost will continue to rise while planned use and availability have decreased. Without objection, so ordered. It reads, cost to sustain the F-35 fleet keep increasing from $1.1 trillion in 2018 to $1.58 trillion in 2023. Yet DOD plans to fly the F-35 less than originally estimated, partly because of reliability issues with the aircraft. The F-35's ability to perform its mission has also trended downward over the last five years. Is there any of that in the GAO report that you disagree with? Uh, I don't, no. Okay, so how many hundred million dollar paperweights do we own? I would not categorize the F-35 as a paperweight. Well, if, we, if it's not mission capable, if it's, what, what, do we just stare at it and admire it? We, we continue to work to make sure that we, uh, we uh, get our aircraft uh, operational and continue to... Uh, and, and I don't know, don't you think at 100 million a clip, more than 29% should be fully operational? And if the fact that we can't get them operational, you know, you know what Secretary Kendall said when he was sitting in that chair? He said the core root of the problem is that we had let Lockheed Martin build this thing, and then we gave Lockheed Martin the full system performance contract. And they keep bilking us 
according to the GAO, and we sit around staring at a $100 million airplane that can't fully perform the mission, and you're sitting here telling me it's, a, it's not a failure. Just own up to it, Mr. Secretary. Just say, this airframe has not delivered, it's too costly, it's not, it's not being utilized as we should, and we should never again make the mistake of doing a full system performance contract with the very person who built the aircraft. Could we agree to that? I agree. In the future, okay. we should take a, we should have a different approach. I'm sure that Secretary Kendall well, also told I think you the, committee is the help things that he was to doing to get the approach up, uh, quite quickly. Yeah. Gentlemen's time's expired. Let me uh, give people a, our situational awareness. Votes have been called. There is a series of nine votes, uh, six amendment votes or two minutes. Uh, my plan is to continue for about another 15 minutes before we recess and then come back at the conclusion of the votes. The walk-off time will be 12.30. Uh, with that, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Moulton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, you said your budget priorities are near-term readiness, modernization, and support for troops and families. Those absolutely seem like the right priorities for me. Uh, Chairman, you've famously said, quote, accelerate change or lose. And of course, you're talking about our pacing China, a uh, pacing challenge, China primarily. But Mr. Secretary, you also explained that your budget, quote, dials back some modernization. Now, how is that compatible with accelerate change or lose? So those platforms that won't deliver capability before 2030 are the ones that uh, we chose not to uh, invest in in this budget. Now, we recognize that we will invest in those, uh, those programs uh, in the out years. Uh, and that'll require uh, an increase in the top line. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, most of this committee is in wholehearted agreement that this budget is inadequate, but why would you delay modernization rather than following the lead of the Marine Corps and just cutting old systems, many of which are big and expensive to maintain? Well, that's, uh, that's part of the dialogue we have with, uh, with our Congress. And that's from what the, the challenge that I see in some cases where, uh, and it, as we look at the capabilities that we have to have today, at the same time the, uh, uh, as we transform the force to the future, and uh, balancing between the two. And, and that's where the focus has been um, uh, uh, across the force. This is an area that uh, we've got to continue to have dialogue of the things that we were willing to let go of so we can actually invest in and modernize in the future. And well, I, I have no doubt that this is your uh, philosophy. I, I question whether it is really the focus across the force. I mean, I think with the exception of the Marine Corps, and, and a, a bit of credit is due to the Air Force as well here, there's been a real reluctance to divest of old platforms. I mean, I asked this question of Army leadership just last week. I said, give me an example <clears throat> of one old platform that you're cutting to make ro room for modernization. And the Secretary of the Army used the future reconnaissance attack aircraft, a future capability. She's talking about cutting a future capability. Can you give me, Mr. Secretary, just a couple of examples of old weapon systems that are big and expensive to maintain that the Army is cutting to make room for modernization? Well, certainly, uh, I mean, if you had the Secretary of the Army here to speak to that, I'm sure that uh, what she told you uh, is, is accurate, so I don't, I don't want to, I won't challenge that. But there are things like older artillery platforms like uh, the uh, M777 uh, that uh, we provided to, uh, uh, to Ukraine that we no longer uh, uh, use in our, in our inventory to the extent that we were before, that, uh, that we are, you know, that we're you know, moving out of the inventory. But s some of these things that are no longer uh, useful for the Army, uh, are useful to us in the next fight. Uh, in, uh, as far as the Army's concerned, we're able to uh, transition those, uh, those items to, uh, uh, to partners and, and allies who, who need that kind of uh, capability. Well, let's do that. I mean, let's sell them. Let's get some money, yeah. right? But we've got to make money in our budget for modernization because if, if we don't accelerate change, accelerate, not just change at the rate that we're changing right now, but accelerate change, we are not going to be able to keep up with China. And Mr. Secretary, I just want to be clear, you are endorsing the Secretary of the Army's response to my question, name an old system you're cutting, when she named a future system that you've chosen not to invest in. No, I, I, uh, the, the reason I said what I said was I, I, I really don't know the full context of, but, but to, to your point, that is a future system and not a, not a system that we would typically look to 
divest of. The systems that we want to divest uh, are the systems that are too, too expensive to, uh, to upgrade, to modernize, or are no longer rel relevant in a future fight. Now, I mean, we, we, we live in a world where $5,000 drones can destroy $5 million tanks. Now, I'm not saying there's never going to be a use for a tank again, but we're still building a lot of tanks. Poland has just agreed to purchase a whole bunch of tanks. I don't know what, what nation they plan to invade with these largely offensive weapons, but that doesn't seem like a very wise investment for us or our allies. So I would just encourage you, I know there are a lot of tank supporters in Congress, there are a lot of F-35 supporters in Congress, but you've got to come to us with tough cuts because coming here and just saying we can't modernize is not acceptable. Replicator is a good example of a, of a revolutionary change. But when they came before the committee, I asked them, you know, Ukraine is innovating a lot on drones. Just tell me, when is Replicator program, with our GDP, going to catch up with Ukraine that has 0.7% of our GDP? And they said, at the present pace, we're not. We can't beat China at that rate. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and thank you to all three of you for being here today. I want to congratulate General Brown on becoming chairman. We were colonels together, one stars, and base commanders in Europe, so congratulations. Uh, my first question is to Secretary Austin concerning the Ukrainian aid. Is it the administration's plan to send long range ATACMs uh, to Ukraine? I hope, I hope, hope it's yes. We, we have already done that, sir. Already done it, so, but the, in, the intention is to keep sending more. Well, we, we will provide uh, as much capability as we, as we can. Okay. So. I think that we, we want to ensure that we're sending difference makers. They're not feeding into the gridlock, from my, from my perspective. Uh, General Brown, I want to talk about nuclear survivability. You know, for 29 years, we flew uh, the looking glass 24 hours a day with a general on board that could take over our nuclear forces of the White House, the Pentagon, or Strat Combo set. In 1990, we stopped flying that mission and had it on ground alert primarily. We think the threats are back to what they used to be uh, with, what, with the behavior of Russia and the behavior of China. And now we have weapons that can strike us in 15 minutes, so we think it's even more imperative to have this capability. What are the plans to, in, to bolster our nuclear command and control survivability? Well, this is a, uh, uh, Representative, it's an ongoing conversation about how we uh, uh, advance our, our nuclear command and control and maintain that nuclear command and control in the, uh, in the environment we're operating in today, uh, particularly against the threat. I would also say uh, as the, you, we advance the technology, there's also opportunities to uh, change that approach as, as well. And so that's where our, our focus areas are uh, as we look at uh, combined joint all domain command and control how that also feeds into our, our new command and control as well. I know there's alternative ways to, to provide that same capability, but my impression has been, this has been under discussion for years now, I think at some point we need to resolve it and have a plan so that we can, and it's not really for us, it's for Russia and China to know that no matter what they do, they can't catch us asleep and can't decapitate us. And so it seems to me that we should have a plan soon, because <laughs> I just feel like this has been an ongoing discussion of what we should be doing. Uh, so I just want to submit that to you. Back to you, Secretary Austin, on Taiwan. Deterrence starts today, and I'm under the impression we're being told that there's a huge backlog of weapons that we owe, owe Taiwan. Uh, one, one report was 20 billion. Uh, what are we doing to expedite getting these weapons to ta Taiwan? Well, I stood up a Tiger team uh, to address this issue uh, as soon as uh, we came on board, uh, figure out what the nature of the backlogs were, uh, was, and then uh, what are the things that we can do to work through those backlogs and, uh, and, and get this capability to Taiwan and others, quite frankly, as quickly as possible. Uh, they came up with a number of insights. Uh, that task force still exists, by the way, and, uh, and my challenge to them is to continue to work through uh, uh, challenges and, and, uh, and obstacles uh, to make sure that we're moving as, as uh, rapidly as possible. As you know, sir, there are a number of things that go into this equation, you know, industry, uh, uh, industrial issues and challenges, um, you know, y y you name it. But, uh, but again, I think we have been able to, to, to move some things forward a bit faster, but this work needs to continue, uh, continue on. We're going to reduce the backlog. Uh, I can't predict uh, to you what exactly when that's going to be, but I think uh, 
you know, it's, uh, it's a thing that we'll stay focused on. So. Yeah, day one of the war is too late, and we just know the best way to stop it is mm -hmm. sea mines, harpoon missiles, long-range air defense. And uh, so I think, you know, obviously it's imperative that we expedite uh, those deliveries. Uh, my last thing I would like to uh, point out to Secretary Austin, or at least discuss, we put a, a 31 recommendations together to improve quality of life in the military. One of them was a targeted pay raise for E1 through E4. And you know, some of the leaders in OSD, I'm not saying yourself, push back on that, saying the pay is adequate. But yet we have good evidence that many of our junior lists are on food stamps, relying on food banks, and we just think we gotta do better. And there was an article that came out today, or was yesterday, that fast food restaurants are paying more than our E4s are getting, who are, who are not married. So we, we hope that we'll have your support uh, for a targeted pay raise for E1 through E4. And with like 15 seconds left, would you care to comment? Well, uh I want to thank you for the support that you've given us uh, to date. You know, I asked you for a 4.6% pay raise uh, for the force in 23. You supported us. In, in, uh, in 24, the, the budget that was just appropriated, uh, we asked you for a 5.2% pay raise. Uh, you supported us for that. That's the that's gentleman's time's expired. Sure, and I recognize the gentlelady from New Jersey. My intent is to recognize the gentlelady from New Jersey and the gentleman from Indiana, and then we will recess till about 1235. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary General Brown, thank you for coming today. Um, I'd like to start off because in February, I went with a Haas Codel to Rafa, in part to see what was going on because of the concerns over the building humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Um, we then went to see Netanyahu, and I, I said to him at that time, that there was a growing humanitarian crisis which he needed to address urgently. Um, I encouraged him to open up a res, the Arez crossing, to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. He did not address this in any marked way until the World Central Kitchen bombing in April. At that time, he did begin to address it, but still not nearly enough to stop the ongoing crisis moving into famine in certain parts of Israel. So part of National Security Memorandum 20's requirement is that the DOD weigh in on Israel's certification that they are addressing this humanitarian crisis. And that's coming up in a little bit over a week as I understand it. Um, Mr. Secretary, can you tell me about your conversations with the Israelis, um, your discussions about our values and why this is critical and what the response has been? Well, this is a point I make frequently with uh, my counterpart uh, and, uh, and, and encourage them to do what's, uh, everything that they possibly can to protect the civilians in the battle space and use uh, the weapons uh, appropriately. Now, this is a professional military and my, my expectation and the expectation of our government is that uh, you know, they, they do, in fact, do that. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a, to answer your question, a conversation that we frequently have. Uh, and, uh, and again, um, we'll continue to have those conversations because it's really important. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, uh, you know, our, our assessment, the assessment that's uh, upcoming, as you know, the state is working on that assessment. And, uh, I'll confer with, uh, with Secretary Blinken at some point, uh, but, uh, but we've not had that, uh, that conversation yet. So. And along the same topic, um, we continue to hear Netanyahu say he's invading Rafa. The president continues to push back against that. There still seems to me to be no viable option for a humanitarian corridor or even a place to receive the 1.4 million people in Rafa right now with tents or humanitarian aid. Certainly the vetting process alone, while Netanyahu suggested it would take him two weeks to do, I, I don't think any of our military would suggest that that is enough time. Can you talk about any discussions you've had with the Israelis regarding Rafa and if you, what you believe their war plan there is right now? Again, I you know, emphasized a, a number of times that, that uh, they must do what's necessary to uh, to take care of these uh, civilians that are not, not combatants and, uh, and move them out of the battle space and, and, and take care of them wherever you move them to. Uh, and, and you have to uh, allow sufficient time to do that appropriately. And, and we've had that conversation a number of times. Uh, we, I have seen, some, seen them do, uh, put some things in place 
but you and I know that there's a lot more that needs to be done before, um, you know, um, we, we can say that they've accounted for these civilians and, and, and taken care of them. Um, I've also asked them to, uh, to do things sequentially. So that must be the first thing that must be done before they consider any other, any other uh, military operations. So. Thank you. And then changing topic, um, you know, I've, I've grown increasingly concerned because we've seen some of the Supreme Court cases on abortion, and recently one of those has been EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, um, and Title X does not cover that. Title X does not cover what EMTALA calls stabilizing care for our civilian facilities, meaning it's not just the health, it's not just the life of the mother, it's the health of the mother. I remain concerned that our service women um, are not being given the opportunity or the protections of their health. And that means that in these hospitals, their reproductive organs are not protected. So in other words, they, the doctors are not required to give them treatment um, simply to preserve their ability to have children in the future. Um, have you looked into this and uh, are we taking any further um, steps to protect our service women and give them better reproductive health care? No, we, we've not, uh, uh, the reproductive health care policy that, uh, that we have in place does not uh, specifically address the issue that you raised, but uh, it, it's a valid issue for sure. I would recommend you get her an answer for the record, because we got to go to Mr. Banks. General A's time's expired. Uh, gentleman from Indiana is recognized. General Brown, according to the Blue Star Families 2023 Annual Survey of Military Families, trust in the military is down to the lowest in, that it's been in 20 years down sharply nearly 20% since President Biden took office. The poll also says that only 32% of military families would recommend service to a relative. That's down 55% since 2016. The National Independent Panel on Military Service and Readiness poll says that 68% of active military members have witnessed the politicization of the military. And the Reagan Institute poll in November of 2022 says that only 48% of Americans had a, quote, a great deal of trust in the military, down from 70% in 2018. What, what do you attribute that to? Well, I appreciate the question. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure what I attribute it to. Um, but one of the things I'm focused on, and I highlighted in my, my message to the Joint Force, is trust is the foundation of our profession. And what I'm focused on is, uh, as, the, uh, as the chairman, is that uh, our trust goes through our members, to their families, our local leadership, and to the nation. You would agree those are disappointing numbers, startling, uh, if they are true, well, really fact? I, I will tell you that, uh, um, you know, I, I, as a senior military officer, I want the nation to trust us. And when General, I see numbers like that, uh, it, it is uh, disappointing, and my goal and is Agreed. to lead by example. Yeah. General Milley testified in this room that, quote, I want to understand white rage. What is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States? What do you think he meant by that, and was it appropriate? I, I don't know what he meant by it. Was it appropriate? Uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on it. General Milley confirmed that he secretly called Speaker Pelosi about President Trump's mental fitness and nuclear command authority. Do you think that's acceptable conduct of someone in your position? Well, I'll tell you, in my position, what, I'll, what I will continue to do is provide uh, uh, professional military advice. Would you ever be open to a call with Speaker Johnson about President Biden's mental fitness? I, I'm going to, when I talk to uh, Speaker Johnson, I'll talk to him about the things that are uh, tied to my make, make it military advice. would be appropriate, advice. though, would it, someone in your position? I, I'd focus on providing military advice. General Milley, Milley told his aides that President Trump was preaching, quote, the gospel of the Fuhrer. Do you think it's okay for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to compare the commander-in-chief to Hitler? In my position, uh, I, I would... Uh, really? Yes or no, uh, General? That No. Is that appropriate? It's not appropriate. General Milley testified uh, in a question to me that he, quote, does interviews regularly with print media, books, documentaries, videos on TV because, quote, it is a part of a senior official's job. Do you agree that talking that frequently to the media as part of your job? Do you talk regularly off the record to book authors? I've been, since I've been in this position, I haven't talked to a book author, but I do talk to the media off the record. Okay. General Milley testified to the Senate that he talks to the media, quote, two, three, four times a week. 
and that it is, quote, very important to make sure that senior officials talk to the media. Do you talk to the media four times a week? Uh, not quite that frequently, no. During his farewell address in reference to President Trump, General Milley said, quote, we don't take an oath to a wannabe dictator. Do you think it's acceptable to cause the current commander in chief a wannabe dictator? I, I choose my words wisely. It's not appropriate, is it? No. To call the commander in chief a wannabe dictator. Your term ends on, in October of 2027. There's a presidential election coming up. The current president might win, the former president might win. Um, that, that's, why this, that's why this matters. And the, the politicization of the military is something that I think all Americans care deeply about because it contributes to that decline in the public trust. It contributes to that historic recruitment crisis that we find ourselves in today. And I'm just curious, General, I've, al I've always wanted to ask you, how can we repair the damage done by your predecessor who, has a, who will always have a reputation as perhaps the most political general that's ever sat in the position that you sit in today? Well, what I'll focus on is, uh, you know, leading by example, uh, knowing and following the, uh, uh, what's expected of us as, as, as uh, military members, and staying true to my oath. I think it's really important. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, as I said earlier, we will now recess for votes. Uh, my plan is, since we we'll walk off the floor at 1230, we'll reconvene approximately 1240.